your life. I know, for some of you, that's a long way. <laughs> Everybody has some defining moments. Events that change our lives. That might be a broken marriage, the death of your mother, or that day you woke up in prison, naked. <laughs> Again! <laughs> I believe through all of life's challenges, the true love will carry us through. Come back with me on a journey. We're going back in time, way back, to a time before some of you were even born. Back to a time before Facebook. Mm -hmm. 1990. That was when I first fell completely, hopelessly, head over heels. Ouch. When I got up, I realised that I had found true love in my soulmate, Vicky. I can still remember that first date. I remember the flash and the sparkle in her eyes when she laughed. The soft, gentle breeze, the way it moved through her hair. And the sweet perfume of the first red rose that I gave her that night. Vicky took the rose and looked a little embarrassed. She shoved it in her pocket and laughed at me and said, You're such a dag! <laughs> flowers off the list. <laughs> Since then, life has not exactly been a bed of roses. But we cherish each other's independence. We value each other's differences. And I agree with everything she says. <laughs> <laughs> we have a normal relationship. We love. We laugh. We argue. She wins. <laughs> we built a house. We raised a family. One boy, one girl, a one streak of brown fur with teeth. <laughs> Our mischievous and beloved silky terrier, Rusty. Picture the scene. I'm at work. I get a phone call. It's Vicky. Martin, our house is on fire. Everything we have is burning to the ground. 4th of February, 2003. It is 50th birthday. Our world had just turned upside down. We're racing home through the traffic, talking on the mobile phones, and she rings and says, I can't find Rusty. I say, calm down. Drive safe. I love you. And then she rang again to say that the roof had just collapsed. I truly thought that we had lost everything. I arrived home to see the fire engines, the media, the Robin X spectators, the acrid smell of smoke hung in the air, and I raced over to Vicky sitting on the limestone wall. And we hugged it. And she laughed. And she said, I told you not to put 50 candles on the birthday cake. <laughs> Imagine how it feels to be standing in front of the ruin of your beautiful home. No change of clothes. No way to sleep. None of that mattered. What mattered was that nobody got Rusty survived. And now we had the chance to renovate! <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Looking through the rubble, there was one amazing discovery. In the main bedroom, this was an area that was hit really hard. There were black and charred beams crashed down. The dresser was black and broken. Sitting up on the dresser. was the dried flower of that first rose, and it was intact. Something so fragile, and yet so symbolic, 
could survive a firestorm and the devastation it speaks to me of the power, the resilience of the true love. Love can be fragile, but true love, the love of a parent, the love of a soulmate, is timeless, unconditional, enduring. Ask yourself, what are your defining moments? What have you learned from them? Have you grown from them? And are you a better person because of them? Life throws us challenges. <coughs> but remember this, even in the blackest charred ruins of despair, true love prevails. Protected like the rose in the trinket books, intact. special guests. Um, special guest is going to evaluate that speech and also give us some wonderful advice. Please make welcome there's Rory Vaden. Those of you that were there at the district convention, do you see a huge difference between that speech and the speech tonight? Yes. Do you remember the number one thing I said that was different between a winning championship speech and every, everyone else? As I said, most people take a nine minute speech and try to cram it into seven. What the winners do is take a four minute speech and deliver it in six. What was the time on his speech? Oh, six. It was, six. was it six, like right at six exactly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know but I, I know that occasionally, believe this, some of you guess, okay, even though you might think this, I know occasionally timers lose track and they actually lie. So I just ask. Five minutes <laughs> 56. So about 5.56? Yeah. That's wonderful. So that, and there was time for the pauses. There was time for the laughter. There was time for the scene, and the, the, the most impressive thing to me is how dramatic of an improvement that was in how short of a time between when I gave you that evaluation, which I guess was Sunday at 3 o'clock, three was that yesterday? Yeah. Two days ago. Yeah, I know. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> what was the acronym that you had, Ross? You said, I, I've got... NYR, not yet recovered. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, fantastic job. I am so excited. And I will tell you that, that that speech is much, much better. And I'm really excited about where we're going to go with it tonight. So, for this evening, it was sort of a, a different situation because about half the audience has seen me speak and knows who I am. The other half are new and, and the other half are guests. Actually, I guess you can have three halves. Now that I think about it, but so what we're going to try to do is, I'm going to try to wrap a teaching part inside of an evaluation for Martin, because my, my ultimate goal here tonight is to serve you and is to give you to give you that chance. And so we'll just kind of see where it goes. But also, to, for the benefit of the audience, I wanted to share a couple things. So one thing I didn't talk about at the conference is. Something that I call secrets of charisma. One of the things that we talked a lot about is how humor is something that can be learned and developed. It's a skill that can be practiced. And those of you that heard the speech at the district conference, would you say this was about a hundred times funnier than that version? There were some really strong laughs. That is really impressive to me at how quickly you not only learn the information but put it into use. So charisma, like humor, is something that can be learned and developed. It is another one of those sort of traits, it's a skill 
that you can manufacture through a change in your mechanics, which is, again, what we've talked about. So we're going to talk about the secrets of charisma because when you are speaking at the World Championship, and for those of you that don't know what the World Championship is, every year Toastmasters has a contest where 25,000 people compete from about 90 different countries over the course of nine months to make it to the, they go through all of these different levels, six different stages, and you get to the top 10 speakers in the world. And I did that when I was 23 years old, when I was in 2006. So I made it to the world championship in 2006 and lost. And then in 2007, I studied harder, worked more, received more evaluations, spent more money on coaching, reading books. We went to Phoenix, Arizona in August of 2007. I've put two years of my whole life into preparing for this contest. My whole family was there, and that was the year that I lost again. But I, lost again. <laughs> I, I was the, the world championship of public speaking first runner-up, so second in the world. Or as Jerry Seinfeld would say, the number one loser. <laughs> How you look at it. And actually in 2006, I like to say I didn't lose, I tied for fourth. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Those of you that are familiar with the contest. So, when you get to this level, because Martin, not to put pressure on you, but I'm sure you'd start, you already feel the pressure. At this stage, he is now in the top 100 speakers in the world. So, that is who you're sitting in the room with, is somebody who's reached an incredible, incredible level. And the scary part of that is he's going to compete against 99 of the other best speakers <laughs> in the world. And Charisma has a lot to do with it. Charisma is, is sort of the intangible. And when we look at the evaluation or the table topic speeches, you know, you have, take Martin Luther King, the I Have a Dream speech, and there's so many amazing elements of that. But one of the things is charisma. Barack Obama was mentioned tonight, and I think Barack Obama is someone that has natural charisma, whether you agree with his politics or you don't. And Bill Clinton was another American president that has a lot of natural charisma. And Velda, like you, I was really thankful that they didn't call on me for table topics, <laughs> because five to seven minute speech, I'm great, give me a 90 second table topic, and I am absolutely nervous as can be. So I was very thankful for that too. So when we talk about charisma, Charisma is a necessary element to compete on that stage because you will take, you suddenly will go from the speech he just gave in this room with maybe 50 or 60 people is dramatically different just by the setting of, of the speech. There are going to be probably 500 to 1,000 people in the regional speech. Assuming that you went there and then you compete a few days later at international, there will be 2,500 to 3,500 that audience. And so the charisma is a very important a, a very important skill because what a lot of people don't realize about speaking is that the this is this is something I believe that I learned from Darren or adapted from Darren is that when when you are speaking your delivery is about one third of your presentation. Your writing, so the actual the actual speech is about one third of the presentation, your skill as a writer, and then another third is actually the setting. The setting has as, as much as 33% to do with how powerful and the impact of a presentation. I can go out and deliver a speech, and I know it's a home run every time. That take the stairs speech, those of you that, that heard it, it's I've done it so many times in so many different settings. Now it was different presenting in front of maybe 150 people at a conference, where normally companies that hire me to come and do a keynote, at this stage in my career, I'm usually speaking in front of more like 500 to 2,000 people, depending on, on the size. But that is a huge part. And so one of the toughest things for you to practice, Mark, is the charisma to fill the setting because it's a big stage, it's a big room, and you have to be very big. And it's hard to practice that, and it's also uncomfortable for the audience if you go overboard practicing that here. So that's what we're going to do is I'm going to present this framework of sort of the secrets of charisma. We will use that as a scorecard for scoring your speech, and then I will go through in detail and evaluate your speech and apply some of these some of these things. So the C, it's, it's an acronym again, all right? So the C in charisma, charisma, 
stands for charge the audience first. We'll talk about each of these in a second. The H stands for half step up a tire. The A stands for always maintain composure. The R is remember power pause. The I is insist on taking control. The S is say it very concisely. The M is make deliberate eye contact. And then the A, the last A, is add the appropriate humor. All right. Wow, that's nice and level. I guess if my speaking career goes down, I could make it as like a second grade teacher. <laughs> Great across. I love it. Very good. All right. So each one of these, we'll talk about very, very briefly. This is about a half-day training program here that we're going to crunch down into about half of 15 minutes. <laughs> but the C, charge the audience first. So what, what I mean by that is most speakers are ovens. What you need to be is a microwave. So, what's the difference between an oven and a microwave, everybody? In terms, what, it's speed, right? What do you have to do with an oven that you don't have to do with a microwave? Warm it up. Preheat. Most speakers are ovens. What that means is, when they come out and they say, "Please welcome Rory Baden to the stage," and most of us take a while to get warmed up. And in fact, in the evaluation that we received on Car Carrie Ann. So you're brilliant and you are awesome and I'm so inspired by the potential of you young lady and, and what you can really be and the evaluation that you got was also very good in some regards. One of them was that most of us will say something and I do this, I did this all the time, I would say thank you fellow Toastmasters and guests, I'm so excited. In professional settings you'll hear speakers say I'm so excited to be here and it's been a great journey and blah 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 blah. And they are, they're warming up. They're warming up. And here's the thing. There is one moment, one moment in every speech, and only one, where you have the entire dedicated focus of everybody in the audience. One moment. It's the first moment. Everybody's tuned in. They are curious. After that, you are competing against diminishing attention spans, and people take these little mental vacations, right? They, they, they leave the room. I mean, even while I've been up here talking, like half of you have been back to your work, you know, over to what are your kids doing, some of you are thinking about how you got to take a pee. <laughs> your mind goes, right? So that's, that is how it works. So you have to capture that opening moment. So charge the audience first is all about speech openings. There are seven key ways to open a speech that I have found that work really good. And again, we don't have time to go through all of these, but I, I will give you, a, I'll, I'll run the list for you all really quick. So here they are, a story, a joke, a statistic, a gesture, a provocative statement, a prop, or a quote. But the concept here is you've got to be ready to go. Now your speech, okay, to apply this principle directly to your speech, you started with a joke, and I liked it. So you said, look back over your life, and I realize for some of you that is a long way back. Now one of the things that you did very well in your speech, because you probably inserted something like, I would say nine new jokes into your speech. I'd say about six of them, maybe seven of them hit and worked, and so that's where you gotta listen to the recording, keep those, ditch some of them, modify the others. So you did a really good job of this one, always maintaining composure. So when a, when a joke bombs, you did a great job of not letting the audience know that you were trying to be funny. You did a really, really <laughs> good job of that. I know that up here in your mind, you were sweating going, 
Oh my god, nobody loved me! Oh my god, it's funny! I can't believe it! It's miserable! And, and yet, the, the metaphor, the analogy there is you gotta think of a duck. So a duck swimming across the pond, on the top, calm, cool, pristine. Underneath, what is happening? Paddling frantically, right? So as a speaker in the contest, your nerves will be going, you will be freaking out if the laugh doesn't work, or sometimes in the, in the world championship, they will laugh at things you never intended to be funny, and that, that throws you off. Because it's like, I wasn't even trying to be funny, how come they won't laugh when I'm trying to make them laugh, and then they laugh when I'm not trying to make them laugh, or whatever, something like that. So, you did a good job of that. So your first joke, so you tried to start with a joke, which I think is great, and I think that's really important, because you do drama very well, and you have to work on humor, so we talked about that. Look back over your life. I realize for some of you that is a long way back. It wasn't a big laugh, but I liked it because it did add space. So there's three things you're doing with that opening line. You're doing charge the audience first, always maintain composure if the joke doesn't work, and you're adding the appropriate humor. Remember we said it's easier to start high, with laughter and then come down to come down low. So coming back to my graph that I talked about this weekend a little bit, I didn't actually show it this way, I showed half of it this weekend. But this way, if you have this graph and up here is laughter and joy, and down here is sort of emotion and introspection. Right? So you remember we used the analogy of the ECG, how uh, most speeches kind of just stay, they, uh, when, you, when you graph the attention span, so if this one is attention span, this is what I showed you all this weekend, most speakers, the audience's attention kind of goes like this. And so what you want to do is create a speech where you capture their attention and then you bring them up and down on this, kind of like a sine wave here, or an EKG and you're, you're going back and forth. Now the error that I made in 2006 in my speech is I went down to deep, intense, this is drama, right? And once you come down, it's really hard to get them back up. So, so you're doing good things there with your joke. The, so even if they don't laugh, I still like it because it's very light. You say, you say look back over your life, I realize that for some of you, that is a long way back. I think you need to just work that a little bit. I think there's humor there. Your setup is what is what really needs work. And for the audience, is this what? No. So for those of you, again, that weren't there this weekend, you got setup, which is creating the expectation, pause, punch. Here's the punchline. And then this, is the expectation that you want the audience to think that you're going to say. So when you say, take a look back at your life, the audience just kind of thinks you're done, but you might want to, somehow you can create a stronger setup where you say, take a look back on your life. Think, think back to when you were young. I realize for some of you, that's a really long time. And then you might even be able to add something like, because looking out at the audience, it looks like some of you are in the Yoda stage of life. <laughs> right? Something, something like that. There might, it might be an add-on to what you already have, but I think there's something there to play with. But even if you don't get the laugh, maintain composure and move on. It's very light. So you did a good job. You did a good job of that. Let's talk also about your opening half step up attire. Remember how I said the speech title is something that people drastically underestimate the importance and the power of the speech title because the introducer reads it twice. They say, with his speech, the rose, Martin, Martin, the rose, or however, however, however they say it, right? So your attire, it's been a long time since I've been in the contest. <laughs> I know, it's been a long time since I've been in the contest and I realized that at my Toastmaster habits have sort of changed. I, I, I know that I say, um, okay, I don't care, I have the trophy. <laughs> know that I use notes, get over it, right? So, <laughs> fortunately, you don't get to evaluate the evaluator. This has always, always been a good part about Toastmasters. So your attire, 
half step up attire is an element of charisma. And what I mean by that is you want to be a half step nicer dressed than everybody else. If you are, than the audience. If you are a full notch above, then there, that creates a, dis, a, dis, a barrier between you and the audience. It's a disconnect because now you're not one of them. If you are sort of under the audience, that doesn't create the sort of composure. So there's times when I will underdress on purpose, specifically if I'm speaking in front of kids, as an example. But you want to be a half step nicer dressed. So, for example, I didn't wear a tie tonight because I assume most people probably would not be in suit and tie. But I have a vest. It's very intentional. I, I'm very intentional about cufflinks. So it's like a dressed up version of casual. That adds to your charisma. If you think about in a room, if a woman walks by in a, a bright red dress, right, and it sort of attracts everybody's attention, it's, you're using that element of dress to sort of separate you. And it, it's, it's, it creates this magnetism. So think very intentionally about your dress. If I know I'm going to be around people who are all in suits, I might have a vest and a tie and a pocket square, for example. So it's got to fit your style. It's got to kind of fit the speech. But I would, I would think about that, and I would, I would consult somebody, perhaps, on what you should wear for, for the event. So I think, I think there's room for you to improve that and be intentional about that. All right. Remember the power pause. Remember. Remember. Remember the power pause. You do a great job of that. You do naturally a good job. And the lesson for everybody is we say, you, pauses are powerful. And the way that you can say it is, pauses are powerful. Or I can say, pauses are powerful. <laughs> Feel the difference? Mechanical change in your delivery, but an incredibly different experience or this is you know, what I, I sometimes refer to as the emotional experience for the audience. So we are trying to move people emotionally. The stronger your writing, the more area that grows in here. The stronger your delivery, the more area that grows in here. The stronger the setting, the more area that grows in here, the bigger opportunity for a peak emotional experience. Now the setting, fortunately, at the World Championship, one place you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be amazing. They have great sound, great video. Although, let's, while we're on the topic of setting, let's skip down here to make delivered eye contact. Your eye contact is average. And by average, I don't mean average compared to the average speaker. I mean it's very normal compared to everybody in general. For, for most people, this is what they consider eye contact. Right? This is eye contact. For an experienced Toastmaster, such as yourself, this is what we, you would probably call uh, eye contact. In fact, there was a reference in one of the evaluations about about eye contact. You made good eye contact. I think Robin was talking about it in the table topics, right? This is eye contact. Championship level presenters, to a champion level presenter, this is eye contact. <laughs> Do you see the difference? <laughs> it's a big difference. And for those of you, for those of you, there's there's probably just in the time, I, just in the time that I have been up here, how many of you have felt like I have locked eyes directly with you since I've been up here? Yeah, it's been stronger on this. I've been stronger on this side of the room than I have on this side of the room. So what I mean by make deliberate eye contact is extended eye contact. You make extended eye contact, and don't look people in the eye. Look them in the pupil. That's what creates that experience. If somebody has ever, if you've ever walked out from a speech and you said, wow, it felt like that guy was talking just to me. That is partly influenced by the mechanics of deliberate extended eye contact. So in general, all throughout your speech, I think this is something you could do better. Now let me give you an advanced tip. I probably shouldn't be telling you all this. <laughs> At the championship. At regionals, you likely will not have an iMag camera. Do you know what an iMag camera is? Does anybody know what an iMag camera is? Okay, an iMag camera 
is where you've got, let's imagine this camera right here, okay? What an iMac camera does is that they, they record you and then you are up on the screen. So they have these big external screens. So in a, in a big, big rooms, big audiences, they have that. Now at regional, I would imagine you won't have that. So here's where the tricky part of it is. At the regional level, you'll have a big room. It's very, if you have a thousand people and there's no iMag, it's incredibly hard to make, I mean, you're not going to make eye contact with every person in the room because there's, there's, there's not time and you, you're, you would get lost just focusing on that and that's not what you want to be focusing on. If you want to practice that now, that's not something so much to be worried about then. But in a room full of a thousand people, the way that you do this is you pick one person in each section. And what happens is the room is big enough and you look at one person in that section and one person in this section and because the room is so big, everybody in that section feels like you're looking right at them. So that's how you do this in front of a big room. Now here's the real key. Again, this was a mistake that I made in 2006 that was a difference between 2006 and 2007. So what I did in 2006 was what is what I call fire hose eye contact. It's what I describe as how the average Toastmaster does it. It's just kind of like you're, you're spraying a fire hose or sometimes you're nervous and so they say, look above the person's head, don't look at their eyes. Well, that might be okay if you're freaking out and you're so nervous, but for those of you that know about the 67% sexual fantasy thing, <laughs> and now you, that was an inside joke and you should have come to the conference. <laughs> And, but once you get past that stage, you, you, what you want is to do is eye contact. Now, at the championship, so here's what happens. When they have an IMAC, and they will have it when you get to the championship, what happens is the camera is on you, and you're on the screen. So what happens is if you come over to this back corner to make deliberate eye contact, what I'm teaching you to do now, in regional, that's very important. You look here, you look here, right? You look at that back corner, you look at this corner. At regional, very important. At international, what happens is if I come and look here, the camera is catching me sideways. So what happens is on the screen, it looks like I'm looking at nobody. And people in the world championship stage, they don't watch the speaker, they watch the screen. So when you want to make eye contact deliberately in that powerful moment, what you do, you look right into the camera and you say, love is forever. Love is eternal. And I'm not looking at anybody, but the feeling is like, whoosh, it's this big wave over the audience because it's amplified by the video. So what, but in my 2006 speech, if you watch the film, you'll see it. It's like the whole time I'm just I'm looking all over the place, and I don't I don't ever get that emotional connection. So that's an advanced, really really high level kind of stuff uh, that that you should definitely be learning, Carrie Ann, on your second speech. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see what else here. The yeah. Let's just, so now let's just kind of go through your speech. We've hit on a, a bunch of these. You're really good at this. I'm so, so proud of you. I am so, so proud of you. You tried hard, and wow, it worked. It worked, it worked better. Amanda will tell you, I was, reading, I was reading the speech, and I laughed out loud. I, I read the, the revision, and I, there were a couple times where I laughed out loud, and there's one joke that you need to bring back. Do you know which one it is? Which one? Oh, no, 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 no. There's one joke that was in your manuscript that you sent me that you didn't say tonight. Yes, yes, that's the one. So, so let's talk, uh, let's kind of go through your speech here. All right. So, look back over your life. For some of you, it's way back. We talked about it. Good job also making this the past. We talked about that in your first evaluation <laughs> instead of this. So that was great, and that created a that created a thing uh, that was really good. That's called hologramming the stage. You create an invisible set up here, and you 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 create spaces for different things. And this is the past. That's the future. Everybody has defining moments that profoundly change the way we think. A broken marriage, the death of your mom, 
or that time you woke up in prison naked. <laughs> that was awesome. That was so funny. So definitely keep that. That is what we call the egg yolk joke. The egg yolk joke is the, the, the joke that cracks the room open. You got to have your, I said in your first evaluation, save the best joke for first because you need the egg yolk joke to crack the room open. And once you crack it open, they will give you laughs that you don't, you don't really deserve because they jump to the conclusion that you're funny and you, <laughs> and you got a couple of, you got one of those. You got a really strong laugh on the description of the dog. What's his name? Rusty? Yeah. Rusty. And they laughed on your description, which I, I noted that that was really cute, but you actually got a pretty good sized laugh, and it's because of that egg yolk joke effect. So that was great. That is a great line. Now, what you did that was needs improvement is you stepped on the laugh. There are two laughs there. So the, the first laugh, you, you, you ran it all together. So a, a broken marriage, the death, of your, the death of your mom, or that time you woke up in prison, naked. So, you're using the rule of three. That's one of the things that I taught you from the humor book, right? From my first book on laughter, I said the rule of three, anytime you have a list, you make the first two items things that would normally be found in that list. Think back of significant events in your life. A broken marriage, a death of your mom. They create the expectation. They assume the third thing you're going to say is your high school graduation, the day your first kid was born. And you saw that and then you, bam, you hit them with that time that you woke up in prison, naked. And it's great because you had the pause, which is right after that time you woke up in prison, pause, naked. Funny. But what you did is then you stepped on the laugh and you said, again. So you, it, it, what you want to do, deliver the line, let the laugh happen, let it roll, and then I would play with, this is, called a, this is called a tag online. So you get the first laugh, and then the tag online, it, it might just be the word again. So you let the laugh go and then say again. Uh, or you could also add a funny facial expression. So facial expressions is in the humor book when you read. What, did you, you got it, right? Yeah. You got the humor book. You got both. The whole thing. You got the next level package. Okay, so, so what's going to happen... One of the things I say is that facial expressions are the most underutilized way to get laughs. That is a great place that you can get a laugh with your face by just saying, in, in, in prison, naked. It's laugh, and then you, can, and then you say, again. <laughs> <laughs> just like that, all right? So I would pause, and then you just go, again. I would play with that, because that's really, really good. And then... Right there is where I would do your fellow Toastmaster contest chair if you're going to do that line. That's probably where I would, I would do it. Uh, okay. Here's the thing. This is, believe it or not, still your biggest problem. Your biggest opportunity. You did a great job. You cut out two-thirds of your speech, and it was a lot better. There's still... What you are still missing is a message, and that is the most important part of a presentation. Every speech has to start with the message. So what is the message? Okay. So first of all, you have your topic. Your topic is love. Then you have your message. The message is what do you want the audience to think, feel, or do when you're done? What is your message of this speech? True love prevails. True love prevails. Okay. Not a bad message. It didn't come through clearly. If you ask the audience, if you took a survey, you said, what was his message? You would probably get eight or nine renditions of this. So it was a lot stronger and more clear. <coughs> it needs to be even mentioned more directly, here's what I would, can, I think your message could be, or that you could play with, is that <coughs> pausing for dramatic effect. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
this could pop. So this is, remember, think, feel, do. Think. What do you want? It's one of these things. What do you want the audience to think, feel, or do? This is more of, this is a think message. I want the audience to think. True love prevails. Stronger messages, the strongest messages, I think, are these ones. Take the stairs. Do the things you don't want to do. So my message is actually, to use a parallel for me, you've got topic, self-discipline, message, do things you don't want to do, right? You heard that, you heard my speech. And then up here is what you kind of have is the brand or the title or the metaphor. Often the same thing. So for me, that's to take the stairs. For you, it's the roads. So you have this right here is congruence. What you're going for is congruence between these three things. So you've got these, these and these are great, it's congruent. Your message is where you're, it's kind of fuzzy. So, a message that I, I think this is a, could, you could try. The, the, the other reason why a, me, a do message is more powerful is it is you focused. It's directed to the audience member. It's not this blanket statement, true love prevails. It's, it's I'm talking to you. This is what you need to do in your life, right? That's a resonating deal. Uh, so, I think your message might be some rendition of this. You can rebuild anything. if you still have love. And I think the metaphor, your house burning down, becomes the metaphor for all the relationships that all of us have burnt. For everybody that we have ever lost touch with. For everybody that we have ever talked about them bad behind their back. For everybody that we missed their, their wedding or their graduation party or for everybody who I said something to them that I didn't mean and I haven't talked to them for 20 years. I burnt that relationship to the ground. And now I'm scared that I won't be able to get it back. I'm scared that it's not going to work. I'm scared that if I try to talk to that person, they're not going to want to talk to me. I'm scared that I've lost that person from my life. And I am telling you that true love prevails and you can rebuild anything if you still have love. That is a championship message. That is a life-changing message. If you change people's lives, you'll win the trophy on accident. Right? So I think that if you draw the parallel, the, see, the, the, the thing about... I'm looking for the board over here. <laughs> Say it very concisely. The part that's missing is this whole thing is still about you. It's still about my story. It's still about my relationship. It's still about this. And, and remember, the key, I focused story, but you focused message. All the, the audience doesn't care that much about what has happened to you. They only care about what this means for their life. Man, this guy had a house burned down. That sucks. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's like, okay, what do you want me to do about it? Like, uh, what, you know? And, you, and that's what most people tell this speech about. My dog died, or my mom died, or I lost a battle of cancer. And it's like, I feel sorry for you, but what do I do with that? You need to translate it to a you-focused message. This speech is not about you, it's not about your wife, it's not about a house burning down. It's about that woman in the 17th row, who's three rows from the end, who's about to have a divorce. And, and she said something to her husband that she thinks she can never take back. And she thinks that marriage is over. And she stumbled her way to the conference, and she happened to buy a ticket to the speech contest, and you come up, and you happen to be all the way across the world from Australia, you are there in that moment, at that time, for that woman. 
That's what your speech is about. So work that. I think the, the, the parallel of the burned down house is a parallel of all the relationships that we've ever burned. So if you as you draw that out, I think I think you're going to go you're going to go a long way. Uh, there's still uh, room for a little more emotional attachment to the rose. The you did a better job. You introduced the rose to us earlier, and it was kind of like a self-deprecating home. Yeah. Well, I don't know. The, the dag thing is great. You got to keep that. And I have no idea what dag is. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? It's really funny that I just said that because I was just thinking about how funny it would be if I said I didn't know it. But now that it came out of my mouth, I'm realizing you're going to be in America. Nobody's going to know what a dag is. I think you. It could still work. You could either cut it. You could change it to some American word. What's an American word for dipstick? Dipstick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that could work. But you, you might, you might, it might work with Dag. See, there's an element of cuteness, and there's also an element of letting people know you're from Australia. And there's some of that that's kind of endearing to to know that this person is from another country, right? I mean, that's that's why I say like. I don't know what bag means. It's kind of like endearing to be like, ah, he's an idiot, right? Like, <laughs> and, and so I think little nuances like that can be fun if you can make them relevant. So I would try versions of what you said. See if you get the laugh here on both lines. If you do, I would keep it. Uh, if not, try to change the word bag because the, the setup is really strong. And so I, would, I, would, I wouldn't mess around with that too much. You can always say, not funny yet. <laughs> Thanks, I will. Yeah, now they're inside jokes. <laughs> okay, so that was, yeah, that was really good. You had so many good lines. Cross, cross that one off the list. Very funny. That was a, that's a tag online, so that was brilliant. And I agree with everything she says. I laughed out loud when I read that. I, that is a home run. And, and now here's the other thing. You need to allow for a line like for a line like that, and actually the better line. So that's that's a great line. And then you added this, which wasn't in the script you sent me. We argue, she wins. <laughs> in an audience of a thousand people, that laugh can be as long as six to eight seconds. Those of you that, uh, I'm going to show my championship speech if we have time, which we don't. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, well, we're gonna, I have a few other things here. We're going over time, though. That's okay. Again, I have a trophy. I don't care. <laughs> you can read the buzz. Just buzz me. Can you buzz me? Just buzz me. No. All right. Glad that we got past that. All right. So, but yeah, there's a speech. There's a joke in my championship speech that is 11 seconds of laughter. Nothing, it's 11 seconds straight of laughter, and that's why you, you know, the Olivia Schofield, that's how you go two seconds over, is by delivering the speech of your life, everybody loves it, it's so amazing, and you went two seconds over because they were laughing so hard. So you got to be, that's why it's got to be a six minute speech, because that six minute speech in front of 2,000 people will deliver in seven minutes, and it's, you know, if something else happens, it's, it can go even crazier. So the joke that you left out was, that also made me laugh out loud, was when you were saying that you were saying some, something about love before. Yeah, you were saying, da, 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 hold on, let me find it. I picked myself up and I knew that I had found true love with my soul and Vicky. I had been in love before, but back then I knew less about love and relationships than Mark Richards knows about dancing. <laughs> so good. Now, here's the thing. That joke would never work in the U.S., but actually it would. Do you remember in the Take the Stairs speech where I showed the magazine cover? 
And I said, we, live, we don't live in a take the stairs world. We live in an escalator world. We live in a world where you see this kind of stuff. And I showed the magazine cover, how to get rich quick. Magic pills, secret potions, hidden formula. And it's not just in our financial lives, it's in our physical lives. Some of you will recognize this picture, and it's that buff guy. And I said, this is actually a picture of Mark Richards. Everybody laughed. I, again, I'm giving you like the secrets I shouldn't be telling you. <laughs> I use that same exact joke in almost every audience. All I do is change the name. So, you, the, the key is, who is somebody everybody's going to know? John Lau. Exactly. Everybody is going to know John Lau. So, just think of the line. You can practice it with whoever is the president of the club. Practice it with whoever is the, you know, the, the head of the church or wherever you're practicing your speech. But at the, at the contest, probably John Lau or maybe somebody. It's got to be somebody like that. But I'm, it's probably John Lau. Um, but, but it will come across as completely, it's called planned spontaneity. That's what the phrase is. Planned spontaneity will come across completely hilarious. So keep that, add that line back in and start look, developing that skill of planned spontaneity. The, uh, the, the whole stuff, uh, you said, yeah, I guess you took out the part about I thought love was about ownership and she was my girlfriend. I learned the book. What's that? You forgot it? It was actually okay without it. The, the thing that I'm still missing is the story is in the struggle. The story is in the struggle. And I don't, I don't know if this is how it was, but if this were a Hollywood movie, what would happen is they would say that you and your wife were struggling, and then the house burned down, and then that saved the marriage, and that was the thing. But I, don't, I think that would be, if, if, some, if there's an element of that that's true, kind of bring that in. But if that's not true, I think that's that's too incongruent and dishonest to lie about. Um, so I wouldn't do that. But that that, that what that's the kind of story we need to see some of the struggle. Your struggle with love, your struggle with relationship. The metaphor of the house burning down has to somehow parallel the mistakes that you've made in relationships, because then it comes full circle at the end when you deliver this to the audience. All right, so that's the part you gotta you gotta really work. Good description of the dog, very funny. You still telegraphed your story about the house. You said, picture the scene. I'm at work. You know, Vicky, the phone rings. You can cut out that whole line. Instead, just go to February fourth, two thousand and three. Vicky's fiftieth birthday. Hey, babe, what's up? Our house is burning down. Big pause. And you need the big pause before and after, because the first half of your speech is now really funny. It's a big emotional shift for the audience. You need a big pause. You say, hey babe, what's up? Facial expression drops. Transition your weight. Slight change in your sight line. Suggests a different character, right? So, hey, hey, babe, what's up? Not huge. Don't do, don't do the cheesy postmaster thing. <laughs> Subtle. Slight. Our house is burning down. And then go. It's and, and that's where the speech changes. And and right there is where I don't want you to retell the story, I want you to relive the story. In that moment, I want you to physiologically feel the way you felt in the moment when you heard your house was burning down. Because the audience will feel that pain with you. And that's part of the emotional journey that you want to take them on. You did a great job with your vocal quadrants, the four quadrants of vocal variety was really good. Your drama after that was so good. The, the, all of this stuff is, is it's, it's all going great, and the biggest thing that you miss, you need, is that huge. You need clarity about what your message is. You need to draw the parallel between burned down house and burned relationships, and then at the end, you, you, you need to make it about the audience. Who in your life have? Because you you say something like this. You say. Yeah, life throws you challenges, and then the blackest charred ruins of despair true love prevails, like the rose in the trinket box. Uh, 
you know, that's not a bad line, but you say, though, this is the part. What are your defining moments? What have you learned from them? How have you grown from them? Are you a better person because of them? It's too generic. It's too broad. I want emotional pinpoint accuracy. Who in your life have you, where have you burned a relationship? Who have you lost touch with? Who have you, have, who, which relationships have you damaged? I know you're scared. I know you're hurt, but I promise you, you can rebuild anything if you still have love. That's that's the, that's the money right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all I have for you, man. Other than that, it's awesome. <laughs> of doing the work and you'll start to see things differently. That you will actually look at presentations and speeches through a different set of lenses than you look through them now. That's what makes a champion. Not the trophy, not the badge, not any of that stuff. And, and truly the magic is when you reach that woman in the 17th row, three rows from the end, who's about to go through the divorce. And that's where this becomes a career for you. That's where it becomes a calling. Like that's, 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 that's the next level. And you can get there. Get there. So keep working, man. So for those of you, even though we didn't evaluate your speech, did you did you learn something from all of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, let's put this in. There is a. So I'm trying to be get us out of here, not like ridiculously late. There is a lot, a lot going on there. We can take. I left this site because there's a lot of diagrams. You can take a picture of it before we, before we take off or whatever if you want. Mark, yeah, yeah, right here. So there is. So to 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 tie some of this together. In the, that larger, to come back to this larger context. So I brought, I mentioned this this weekend. Everything that we just talked about is right here in mechanics. Right, right here in this mechanics part. Stage time is what you'll need. You, you know, you'll need the writing, and you're going to get the education from the stuff that you picked up. The model is, this is what we refer to as the business of speaking. This is how do you make money as a speaker or a trainer. And then messaging is branding. This is sort of marketing and your, your branding. Inside of a speech is exact, exactly what I wrote on the board. Topic, message, brand. Topic, message, brand. Topic, message, brand. If you know what the topic is, have the message clearly defined before you, you do anything else. Because that, that message becomes the, the litmus test for which what gets stays in the speech and what doesn't. If it doesn't forward that message, you cut it. Only gets to stay if it forwards. So uh, for those of you, we know we have a bunch of you that weren't here this weekend, so I wanted to at least introduce you to some of the, some of the learning that I've gone through.